This is a bomb calorimeter. This is the actual piece of equipment that researchers use to calculate the energy content of either biodiesel or maybe even the potato chips that you had for lunch today. When they calculate the amount of energy, they're going to calculate it in heat units, which would either be gels or calories. I want you to look inside the bomb calorimeter inside here. You can see that there's a silver bucket water goes all in here, and this is actually the bomb is the smaller silver cylinder what you do is put your fuel sample in there, then these two electrodes are connected to the bomb. These provide the spark that will ignite your sample when your sample burns, or combust that gives off energy. So how is the energy collected, or how did a scientist figure out how much energy is being given off? Well, it's a closed system. There's a lid here that goes on top of this calorimeter, and what's in here, in the lid is a stirrer. The stir is going to stir the water. That's in this big pool here, so that the heat given off from the sample is going to warm the water, in a uniform way. This is the temperature probe. This goes down in the water also and measures the change in temperature because as the sample is burned, it will give off heat and the temperature the water will increase. So the lid goes on the sample is prepared. The last thing that you need to make a combustion reaction happen is oxygen and at some point, during the process, some oxygen is added by a tank, that's connected to the calorimeter here. So we are going to burn a sample of the biodiesel that you've prepared and get some feedback on the energy content of it. You'll be able to use this to compare it to petroleum-based fuels like octane. The brain is basically built from the bottom up first the brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills biologically. The brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry it's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in a reciprocal relationship, the relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that we mean what we refer to as the servanderturn nature of children's interaction with their adults' development and the impact of experience on development is not a one-way street. It's a back-and-forth interaction. The brain is a highly integrated organ which has multiple sections that specialize in different kind of processes. So we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function and other parts that are involved in processing of emotion and parts involved in seeing and hearing. So if a child is emotionally kind of, well, put together and socially competent, that will affect more positive and productive learning. And if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be, his or her learning is going to be impaired by that kind of emotional interference.
this phenomenon of conservation is explained by what we call the first law of thermodynamics, sometimes referred to as the law of energy conservation. The law states, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Energy can be described as the ability to do work, where work is the movement of matter, when a force is applied to it. A closed system is a system in which no matter, or energy is allowed to enter or leave. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that the amount of energy within an ecosystem is constant. It doesn't change. An open system, on the other hand, allows stuff to come in and go out. Since most systems are not closed, the laws of energy conservation can be rephrased to say that the change in the internal energy of the system is equal to the difference between the amount of energy coming in minus the amount of energy going out. In other words, the amount of energy in the system can change but only if it comes from another system or goes to another system. At any rate, systems, whether they are open or closed, do not create or destroy energy. Rather, energy can enter from one system and leave to another. Wind turbine is a device that will convert wind into mechanical movement, which we can use to power water pump or electricity generator. Now the power that the turbine creates is obviously dependent on the wind speed. It also depended obviously on the number of sails, the area of the sails and the angle of the sails makes to the wind. So you can imagine if the turbine blades flat onto the wind, the wind's going to just bend it. If there is slight angle when the wind hits it, it's going to turn the blades. We can use that for powering things. Now, we're going to have a go, making some of the very, very simple paper windmills, a sort of things that you can make from the bits and pieces lying around home, and use that to drive very small generator to power electronic devices. Many parents communicate and educate their children with two languages, probably because they both know more than one language, or they come from different countries. Most of these parents think this can benefit their children's language learning. But actually, kids will get confused when their parents use different languages from each other to describe the same object. If one parent sticks to one language, and the other one sticks to another language, their children will not be confused anymore.
a PPT is given, and you can read it accordingly. This lecture compares the conditions on the Earth and Mars, as well as the habitability of Mars. There are some similarities such as polar caps, atmospheres and water climate. But Mars and the Earth also have lots of difference. Even the most inhabitable areas on the Earth are way different from those on Mars. In preparing for the Phoenix mission, scientists have done Antarctica trial runs. The lecture also describes different forms of water, hydrology, on the surface and underground of the Earth and Mars. A concise PPT, which can be read directly as a response to this question. We normally see blogging as a two-way interaction in which the blogger, author creates the content and the readers interact, or challenge the author. But the case will be much difficult, when it comes to government, such as the White House, because people will become coarser and write online, especially in the comment area. Hence the governor blog may go wild and chaotic. Okay, so this is the this is the big benefit of a universal philosophy. It says it applies to everybody. Well, looks that doesn't, you know, 205 or 206 countries in the world. And you've got something that applies to everybody. That's a bit strange, isn't it? No, says liberal theory. There are same value structures that apply to all of us. You couldn't have the United Nations without it. It couldn't tell you that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without this idea of values that apply to all of us just because we are humans. Now, the idea is to test that as well. Why is sport universal? Why does everybody play football? It's because the values are specified at a very thin level at the top. There are these rules and we all have to abide by just these rules. But there are lots of things about football that aren't rules specified. So Brazilian football is different from Italian football, from British football, from German football, from Spanish football. It's culturally specific, but acknowledges that there are these universal general rules to apply to everybody. Today, I want to talk about an important aspect of education, which is the education expenditure of the UK, compared with other European countries. Based on a recent paper published in The Economist Journal, UK has only spent 1% of its total GDP on tertiary education, which was insufficient as compared with other European countries such as Finland and Denmark. For instance, the expenditure of Spain is close to the UK in some cases in 2007, and this survey conducted among 50 major cities around the country. However, Denmark and Finland spent much more than the other European countries. So, 
If we decide to compare the education expenditure of the UK with various developing countries, we will find mind-boggling figures in this regard compared to the other countries. Now, why are companies embracing the re-entry internship? Because the internship allows the employer to base their hiring decision on an actual work sample, instead of a series of interviews and the employer does not have to make that permanent hiring decision until the internship period is over. This testing out period removes the perceived risk that some managers attach to hiring relaunchers, and they are attracting excellent candidates, who are turning into great hires. Think about how far we have come before this. Most employers were not interested in engaging with relaunchers at all, but now, not only are programs being developed specifically with relaunchers in mind but you can't even apply for these programs unless you have a gap on your resume. This is the mark of real change of true institutional shift, because if we can solve this problem for relaunchers we can solve it for other career transitioners too. In fact, an employer just told me that their veterans return to work program is based on their re-entry internship program. And there's no reason why there can't be a retiree internship program. Different pool, same concept. This kind of approach is kind of the way some students approach preparing for standardized tests. In order to get test scores to go up, teachers will end up teaching to the test. Now, that approach can work, test results often do go up. But it fails the fundamental goal of education, to prepare students to succeed over the long term. So given these obstacles, what can we do to transform the way we transform organizations? So rather than being exhausting, it's actually empowering and energizing? To do that, we need to focus on five strategic imperatives, all of which have one thing in common, putting people first. The first imperative for putting people first is to inspire through purpose. Most transformations have financial and operational goals. These are important and they can be energizing to leaders, but they tend not to be very motivating to most people in the organization. To motivate more broadly, the transformation needs to connect with a deeper sense of purpose. Take Lego. The Lego Group has become an extraordinary global company. Under their very capable leadership, they've actually undergone a series of transformations. While each of these has had a very specific focus, the North Star, linking and guiding all of them, has been Lego's powerful purpose, inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow. Expanding globally? It's not about increasing sales, but about giving millions of additional children access to Lego building bricks.
So, the idea I'd like to propose today is this, one of the most effective ways of building strong fundamentals in students and preparing them for the future, ironically enough is by looking to the past through the teaching of Latin. Latin will help students think more logically, communicate more effectively and have a more comprehensive understanding of the world around them, no matter how technologically advanced that world may become. To begin with, let's address a common misconception that Latin is a dead language spoken by ancient European 2000 years ago, holding no relevance whatsoever for people living in the 21st century. There's even an old poem that expresses the point of view. Latin is a language, as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. Now students may feel this way sometimes but that this simply is not true, the reality is that Latin never died, and never came to a crashing end with the death of a single tragic figure. Likewise, you can even physically hurt people in a coma, and they will remain completely oblivious and unresponsive. In times not too distant past, this was sometimes used as treating, with doctors trying to shock their victims back into consciousness. Everything was tried from exposing parts of the body to open flames, to severely dropping the body's temperature with ice, to even bloodletting from the head directly. One treatment even included wholly emptying the stomach. We guess because the doctors thought that if a patient got hungry enough, the body would force them to wake up, or maybe they really were just throwing everything including the kitchen sink at the problem, which we're sure was also tried. Comas can occur as a result of serious trauma or as a deliberate medical treatment by doctors. They are typically brought on by traumatic head injury, and it's believed that it's the brain's way of shutting down so it can focus on repairing itself. They can also however be brought on by a stroke, a brain tumor, drug or alcohol abuse, or an illness such as diabetes or an infection. Most of the time a coma only lasts a few weeks though, but past this period the patient can enter a persistent vegetative state that severely lessens their chances of ever coming back out of one. <laughs> 